that the whole discussion was over time was because we had gone to the finance committees and the select boards and said we would cut the overtime in half if we hired two additional staff persons. We hired additional staff persons in April, and here it was in January, and the overtime budget was even more than the year before. Okay, and, and I remember that it wasn't was not a unanimous vote that, in, in my opinion, whenever you try to sell anything because you're going to you're adding a person, you're going to reduce costs. That that never happens in my my experience, so I voted no. By the way, Be, but I, I wasn't against hiring the additional people because I understood what it was going to do, but it's not going to lower our. I don't think I didn't think it was going to lower cost, and and. And, and again, and, and actually, if you add more people, now you're going to have, you're going to, you're going to be paying more overtime well, because Tom, people want had, more time off. It was going to be more expensive, but we agreed that it was better to have more expense of the extra paramedics. Yeah, and absolutely. The board, and I agree we with were you. outvoted on that. I know. And so we hired the two additional persons. We went from eight to ten paramedics, and as a result. There was no additional reduction in the overtime, and that was what the issue was. Yeah, and, and I, so, so I, and I, I understand what's being said, okay? Although I would say if you went from eight to ten paramedics and you kept your overtime the same, then you actually did cut overtime in, in the way, because more people, to me, mean more people, more vacations, more well, everything else. That being said, okay, be more. That, that being said, we have to understand Tim, I'm glad you're only an intro because boy, we're gonna keep you busy. <laughs> but I'm here for the ride. I know you are. It and and it's here for it, a good time, not for a long time. <laughs> well, but but you know what? It's interesting because we're we're telling Tim how much we want to ride the bus, but there's things that we have to have him get done. I I completely agree, and that's why I wanted I wanted to be sure that we capture the intent of this. Is yes, we want the chief to be a working chief. We want them to be able to cover the truck. But we, need, we as a board need to be realistic in our expectations. If we're expecting the new chief to do all this administrative work, they need the time in the office to do the administrative work. If it's a matter of, hey, I, I'm here to fill in. If it's two trucks go out and a third truck is needed and it's once a week, twice a week that that happens, all right, I'll go get on the truck and go do it. But if it gets to the point, if our expectation is every time somebody calls out sick, the chief's going to fill in and start plugging those holes. I don't think that's fair to the position. I don't think that was the intention. And, and I didn't think so either. I just want to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page about that. Um, What'd you got, Tim? Yeah, so there's a lot of benefits to having a working chief. One of them is he's going to go out or she's going to go out and work with the people who are the paramedics normally staffing. So they're going to see job performance, they're going to see training issues, they're going to see, you know, um, people who deserve promotion or, or you know, uh, salary increase because they're doing a better job. Um, it's not just, if you don't sit on the truck and you don't see what's going on, then you're really not a manager. Mm -hmm. And um, to the point of, I would agree with you. Uh, yeah, I agree with you also. I like the fact that you have that the, that our chief, just as our police chief in the town of Sunderland, is out in the field once a while. I think those are advantageous. That's advantageous. Yeah. And that's why I say, you know, yeah. going forward, you know, the first year you have one expectation. You know, in subsequent years, the, the expectation may change. Uh, but that, you know, once the person's hired, the job description is sort of dated anyway, right? Perfect. So, uh, you know, and hopefully you hire the right person and they stay for a good period of time and, you know, then the next boo gets to this kind of the same discussion. No, I, I, uh, I, I agree with everything you say, Tim. Yeah. I, 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 I think that's a point. You don't, well, I think we're all in agreement yeah. that it yeah. should be a working chief. Gary? Yeah. You, you yeah. always thought that, right? Yes. Because I remember you saying that 10 years ago. Right. Um, Crystal? 100% agree that they should. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, I said, yeah, so I think we're all in agreement. Yeah. And, and I would probably say that most of the staff here would think that it's not a bad thing for the chief. Mm -hmm. I think it, it should be like the chief should skill should be just on par as everyone else. And if you're sitting in the office all the time, you're not a good 
paramedic. Like you're not, your skills aren't up to par. This isn't a job where you can just sit around and do nothing, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. It's, you, you need to practice to keep your skills up. Yeah. But also, we only have one person sitting in the office. The chief is the chief. We don't have a deputy. We don't have captains. We don't have lieutenants. We have nobody helping Tim right now. Tim is right. doing all this by himself. Unless stuff is delegated down to just the regular paramedics. Right. So yeah, he has a full plate unless stuff is delegated down to people right. in the department. And we're not, this job description is for the person we're hiring. Correct. And we're in a situation now where we're holding things together, you know, and I think doing quite well. I mean, I, I'm not very, drowning yet. I've been very pleased with the uh, interaction with Tim and, and everything, his willingness to. I, I have yeah. more communication, and Tim has been doing a fantastic job. Okay. Yeah. As to your point about the overtime earlier, I think part of that is looking at per diems. Well, and yeah, and part of the issue, so. Right now, as you said in my director's report, there's a fair amount of overtime open. I've done a surprising amount of, a surprisingly good job at preventing that overtime at the moment by taking people off of day two. But that's the biggest sacrifice we always make, is we sacrifice the second truck to prevent overtime. Um, there's also the overtime we did accrue, some of it could have been prevented with the salary chief. Obviously, I'm not a salary chief, so I can't prevent that overtime at the moment. Sure. Um, but like to Tom's point, or maybe it was your point, I can't remember. Um, <laughs> it's not his point. The board's point. Yeah, the board's point, you can't, you can't expect the chief to fill all those roles, because no. there's days where I'm getting off a 24-hour shift and there's an open shift. If I need to cover that for a few hours, that's fine, but like, there's a, there's a safety point that we'll have with that chief, where we don't want them to be overworked to the point where they're now a risk on the road. Correct. You know, one of the things that Tim, Tim did a nice job when he notified us, us all about the closure of Stillwater Bridge and, and what was being and what was being done, and and I was and I was and I communicated with Tim, and and my concern was so it's a what happens to ensure that we have the same level of care to those people that were we weren't going to be as readily available, to. right? And and and. I was thinking about, well, if we have to put somebody up on the Greenfield ambulance to help a paramedic to help, you know, because I think it's important that we, we still help all of our residents, even if they're cut off. That's what that's that's mom that's mom calls. But but I, I think I you know, so and 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 I thought but after after communicating with Tim it felt like that we had a that we had a plan um so we didn't have but you know it was like okay so i understand it's not a hundred thousand you know a hundred thousand people being isolated from from that care but at the same time we didn't know how long it was going to last and 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 were there options for us to try to pre-deploy people because i looked at the stupid map it's unless you're going through conway or or over the bardwell ferry bridge there's no easy way to get to that that bunch of hillbillies that the folk shark here on, that live <laughs> that live out that She's live out live out that area. But there there is no easy way to get to you. But I thought I thought what Tim had done with working with the the supporting thing. Although I was concerned that we didn't have probably paramedic level service to that. Well, and with and I could have maybe been clear with AMR's primary response at the paramedic level. And then if AMR wasn't available, Greenfield Fire was going to start from Greenfield with us probably heading down 5 and 10 and intercepting with them. Because normally we don't do intercepts with, we only have one truck on. But because they're the people who pay for the service, I had it set up so we would intercept Greenfield Fire and provide right. paramedic level care. Because those people are paying for that service, they should get paramedic level care even if the bridge is closed. <coughs> At least was my thought behind it. Good, good. And that, and that's, and, but see, that, that's, that, what that does though is when you have a back to Tim and everyone's earlier point, when you have a working chief, they're they're thinking of that because they're making those runs also. So I, I do think it's a good idea to have a work the working chief. But I do have I think it's a strong and, and and the other thing is that I, I would encourage with Tim, especially now, that if if members of the Board of Oversight get an email from Tim and have a question, don't hesitate contacting him 
and and you can you can send it direct to him. You don't have to include us all. And he and and what what Tim would do if it's something important, he you know go directly to Tim, and then Tim can disseminate the information back to us individually. But but don't be but don't hesitate if you really have a question to to send something and and I I think that way we all learn we we as a group we all learn Crystal's new to this board and and Fred um, Tim's really there's only a couple years now so he's still relatively new to the group also so if you have a question forward that question to Tim and allow him you know allow him to write back and you don't have to get put us all into it but again. I, I, I felt much better after talking to, you know, emailing Tim about what was happening and what our plans were for that area. It, it was like, okay, we, we got a bad situation, at least we're taking steps to make it a better situation. So, um, Stillwater Road gets flooded sooner than, you know, the upper part near the Stillwater Bridge. So that, if there was an ambulance um, response doesn't matter the road would have been shut anyway mm. even though the bridge was on top of it but the road itself got flooded first and that included so that if you had to respond to the those three houses right next to the mm -hmm. uh, bridge yeah then you would have to go another and, I'd, and, and Jen had been in touch with her Sergeant Bartek had been in touch with me about like yeah. the, if we got a medical in either the low ends of River Road or Stillwater, they were going to go down there first just to make sure that we could actually access it before we responded down there. And we would have got like we would have done if we had to get a boat or something. We would have crossed that bridge when we got there. But it, but the fact that you were thinking about it was I was very happy. I appreciate it. So, in order to inform the discussion about overtime, I wanted to go back to your your vote, Tom, to not hire two full-time paramedics mm -hmm. and if you could explain it would seem to me that that would have impacted the level of service and so that would imply to me that there's there's another way to schedule everything because the level of service is perhaps right now we have 400 hours a week of paramedics and there's 168 hours in a week so we have more than twice as many hours of paramedic Available to the hours in the week. Good, good question. My, my 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 thought process wasn't wasn't my my thought process was how the, it was being sold, saving money. Mm -hmm. I I don't I don't see I don't see it as I I've never seen it as saving oh, money. No, absolutely not. And 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 <laughs> and why do I why did I say that? That I've tried to use that argument a hundred thousand times with my boss and, and different bosses, and it's never, it's never, it's never panned out. Right. Be, because and, and the thing is, and 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 all of a sudden, if if you have a machinist and you say, well, geez, if I had another machinist, then I don't have to have this guy. Well, what ends up happening? All of a sudden, that machinist becomes very valuable to him. So you're 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 doing more work, so you need more people, right? And, and that and that's what I'm, that and that's what part of my thing. It's like I don't I don't know if the what I I listen to to people that were <coughs> the supporting of, of the thing. It, and there was a lot of reasons why adding a different you know additional two paramedics was a, a strong thing. I just didn't like how it was sold. I, I I always try to try to be very. So part of the reason why it was sold the way it was sold, I wasn't on the select board at the time, but yeah. I remember the town meetings. Yeah. And it was that overtime was going to go down because of this. Not not the overall cost of the service because you hire two full time paramedics, they get health insurance, they get uh, you know other benefits. So it's never that was not a cost saving yeah. measure. It was we're going to have the service, we're going to have the people here available to do the work. We're not going to have to rely on per diems. Uh, and over time, as a result, it's going to go down, and it didn't. So, um, I think we, we need to forget about you know any anger that might have been that around one meeting because a finance committee asked a question, and focus on going forward. Um, is the schedule correct? The next director needs to look at the scheduling and determine: is this the best? Is a 24-hour shift the best? Is I don't know the answer to these questions because I've never been a paramedic and I've never worked in a fire department. I'm not saying I know anything. 
I'm just no, saying that this actually, is actually all your questions are actually your, your good question, yeah. and that, and that's what we we need to understand. We need to understand, and, and hopefully Tim can start working on it. Is like what 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 is overtime? What is overtime being used for? Is it being used to cover sick time? Is it being or is it somebody has a 24 does a 24 then and then the, the next day off and then all of a sudden doesn't come in the third day right right so they're using sick time for that mm -hmm. so we have to understand how how overtime what overtime is being right. being used is it you is it specifically like you said being used to cover um people that are calling in out for one reason or are or is a, a percentage of it a large percentage finishing off a call you know like 15 minutes before shift change the other paramedics aren't here you get a call next thing you're out for three hours you know so we don't know right and is there a policy that a sensible policy that says if that's the case and somebody's 15 minutes from their departure time um, does that person get replaced on the ambulance or does that person not replace the person they I don't know what they can't get replaced on the ambulance because it causes a uh, continuity. Yeah, a continuity of care issue, and it, the state would really love, or they wouldn't love, the state would really like to hold us very responsible if there was some sort of issue with that patient okay, care. That's, that's that. a good logical legal reason for this. This is why I say I don't know the yeah. answers. I'm just saying that in, in my estimation, you know, they're, they're, this whole thing needs to be looked at. I would say in... We're basically subsidizing it to the tune of 50%, right? I mean, if it's $1.2 million budget, and we're subsidizing 600,000, then we've made a decision that we're gonna charge taxpayers $600,000 for, for a system that sometimes has excess capacity built into it. And, um, you know, so we need to look at it really hard and determine that this is the right thing. Part of the discussion that got lost in hiring those two extra paramedics was the reduction in the availability of per diems, yep. the number of open per diem shifts that we could not fill, were not filling. Right. And we, we took some of that money to help fund those full-time paramedics. Right. And putting the two full-time paramedics on guaranteed us two more people who were dedicated to us first right. versus people who were dedicated to other agencies and when we needed the help, mm -hmm couldn't provide it because I'm already being mandated to stay at Amherst. I'm being mandated in Northampton. Yep. <coughs> I'm being mandated at AMR. And we had issues filling shifts. And yes, did it help with maybe some of the overtime here? Yeah, but it also became a staff morale issue, a burnout issue. Yeah. And the other issue becomes at the end <coughs> of the shift, the two providers who are on are getting ready to leave. And they've got their commitments, and now we're we're holding people over because we can't get anybody to fill that next shift. So we get into the whether they're coming off of eight, sixteen, or twenty-four. Right. We all know it. I know it as a dad. I got to pick up my daughter when I get out of work, and she's got to go here. And now I'm mandated to stay, and I can't get my daughter to where she's got to go. In a normal job, you might be able to pick up the phone and call. In this job, you could be out on the truck taking care of a cardiac arrest patient. Sure. Your daughter's sitting home and you're lucky to get three seconds to send a text, stuck at work, find your own arrangements. Oh yeah. No, no, yeah. this is this is so. this is nothing to do with the individuals <coughs> and, and you know right. uh, and I, I fully accept that having the people dedicated is a is a benefit. Yeah. It's a big benefit. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and so that's why I say the next chief and the board need to look at this in a realistic way and see if maybe it's perfect. Maybe it's perfect the way it's set up. Um, maybe some small tweaks. Maybe some, uh, you know, occasionally. What happens when you when you only have one paramedic? Yeah. Say say you've got three paramedics on the impact shift. Two of them are gone. There's one left. Well, in that case, the chief goes out with them. But you know, there's going to be a situation where you're going to miss a call because you don't have the staffing. Oh yeah. Well, and right now, because there's a plethora of issues going on right now, but. The impact shifts for this month are almost exclusively open, whether that be because we have taken the full-time staff off of that and moved them into the open primary shift, whether it be because the per diems aren't picking up shifts. Um, and part of that issue is because we're training our new full-time employee, and yeah. we can't 
we can't fill her shift. So there's 40 hours a week that we need to fill, that right now we're plucking people out of their A1 shift to fill, or I'm having mixed success with per diems, as I said. I'm getting some weeks where that have 40 hours, those shifts are covered by per diems, and I get some weeks where there's no per diems available. Um, so it's just, it's an interesting situation at the moment. In the grand scheme of things, I'll have to look into pulling the data to see like what exactly our primary cause of overtime is. I would assume, for the most part, that it's sick call outs. In the summer, it's vacation, obviously. There's a lot of vacation open right now that was awarded before we were down to employees. Um, but in general, I would say sick call outs. But again, I'm, I'll look into it. I'm not entirely sure about that. We also had a, pr a couple pretty active paramedics leave, right. par uh, paramedic per diem employees leave right. as well last year. Last year. We lost two of them, and two of our, like I said in my report, one of our more active basics isn't in the country, one of them has a new school commitment. So those impact shifts that are normally being filled are just not being filled right now, which... So you've got one truck during the impact shift period. We have, essentially, almost every day, we have one truck on during the day. Um, and it's just because, like I said, to prevent overtime, I need to steal from somewhere. So I either, like this weekend, I took Alicia off her shift, her two impacts this week, to cover on the last minute call out on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I moved my, off of two my two impacts this week to cover tonight because mm -hmm. somebody called, wasn't on the shift. Right. So it's- It's complicated, definitely. We've had been lucky that this month has been kind of slow call wise, so it hasn't really affected our care. But down the road, there's the chance that that second truck can be needed and not available. Also people have been flexible. Right. Full -time All the full-time staff have been very flexible and willing to come off of their pre-scheduled shift on the impact to work on the primary truck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's mm -hmm. obviously, you know, we appreciate that everybody's chipping in and um, being flexible while we're down. And, and uh, you know, I, I want to make sure that everybody realizes that at least myself, and I'm sure everyone really appreciates the fact that you're um, you know, being flexible about this and hopefully we can fill and find a great chief and uh, get back to normal as soon as we can. When will Morgan be available? So, Morgan needs 30 ALS calls before our medical director will clear her to work <coughs> without direct supervision. The problem with 30 ALS calls is that we could get seven in a week or we can get one in a week. Mm -hmm. And it's unknown. The, she is currently, we're currently have her on the schedule as if September 1st will be when she's cleared, but I just don't know. Like, I can't give you a hard date because, again, statistically, Statistically, she should be able to get cleared in that time, but yeah. this month has been very slow, so we're not where we so would have expected. So do you need me to call the chest pains like three or four times a week? I mean, I just need ALS calls, so. Well, okay. <laughs> um, you didn't hear that, Chris. <laughs> it was a joke. Don't put that in the paper. We also have our one of our new per diem paramedics. To, he already has medical control through where we primarily have it, and Morgan didn't, so he will be cleared much quick, quicker, and he's already very eager and picked up a lot of training shifts. So hopefully when we get him cleared, he'll be able to pick up some of the holes. And we have two basics that can be, the basics are cleared usually much quicker than paramedics. So once we get them squared away, people always start off at least in the beginning very eager and picking up shifts. So at least for now, we'll see what the future brings. So so I think I think we're on a, I think Tim, you, you, you said it earlier in, in when you're responding, is that you're gonna to have to understand how over time what it's being used for. Right. And I think that that'd be a great step for us. So that when when I I I I I'm not comfortable having open ended conversations with finance committees or citizens when when we're not really covering the entire breadth of discussion. So we're we're talking about that. But if we knew how the overtime's being used then, then we, when we talk at, at a finance committee or in front of town meeting or whatever, then we can explain how, how our overtime, 30% is being used for, 10% is used. And, and I think we're in a much better, we, we make our position as South County EMS, we make our position much stronger by identifying those, yeah, those I'll things. Work on I, I honestly don't know how long it's gonna get to get that data, but I'll that, work on getting it. <laughs> look, you can take all summer. <laughs> Oh, we're halfway through. So you get all half summer to do that. Great. Okay. All right, you want to do the, you want to go 
Tim, I'm your there. Are you all set with that? Yeah, I mean, I'm fine with this as far as uh, you know. Now that you guys have it, so you can look at it. Um, they're going to post a job. Yep. And you know, personnel is going to look at this, and then we'll we'll get a final job description probably halfway through the process. Of well, that's you know, that's fine. But that'll be fine. All right. So you're going to send you're gonna, you guys are going to send it to town council, your Sorry, personnel, and, and that's going to move. And yep. Anybody. So everybody has now a written copy, review it, and if there's any questions, get back to um, send, a, send an email to Tim so that Tim can disseminate it to the people that need to know, okay? Are we all set with that? All right, so that, that was under old business. Any, any other old business? I think that's it. All right. Tim, you want to give your first true director's report? Sure. Um, of course, I don't actually have that. There it is. So, as I said, last June was our busiest month so far with 130 calls for service. Um, and I know we were all very interested in the mutual aid, so you can see on the, the chart that hopefully you all have um, what our actual mutual aid numbers were. Last month we did, what was last month? 22 calls to, for mutual aid. And last month we didn't lose any coverage in our own town because of mutual aid. So in the last six months we've lost, I say lost, in the last six months we've had seven times where we were on a mutual aid call where mutual aid then had to be called into our city. Um, like I said, six of them were in Greenfield. One of those calls in Greenfield was an MCI that required resources from all over the county. So I don't really count that one as much because it required everyone. Um, and then five of those required resources, or five of those required mutual aid because we were doing a call in Greenfield. Um, and that was just, we were on a call in Greenfield and then either Amherst or Northampton had to come in and cover the call for us. Um, we've only done, we've only had to request mutual aid 36 times, which is another 17% on top of what we've done before. So we did 678 calls and then there was an additional 36, yep, 36 calls for mutual aid, um, which isn't, it's not bad. Um, in speaking with people at other services, the, obviously that 17% like the amount we do to Greenfield is still concerning for our service area as it's 20% of our call volume, which is a lot. Um, but again, I don't really know what to do with that data. Like I, it's a conversation we're all gonna have to have. Um, so, so Tim, I think it's important that you report the data to us. Okay. And, and, and you, that's, in, in my opinion, that's something that you really sh need to report the data to us and then the, the political, group needs to address okay okay and 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 you can say just let us know it's your concern okay and then then we're gonna we're gonna have to somehow follow through with that right oh well, i would assume that would be whoever the new chief is is going, is going once they settle in this will be the conversation but by then we'd have a lot of training information without having to go back i mean it's one thing for tim to give us some data as he's moving forward, but to go back and pick up the data is a lot more work. So I think looking forward, we just keep the trending, keep track of it, yep. and if it continues, which it seems like it is, then yeah, we're gonna have to address it. Yeah, but we look for trends in times, days of the week, is there anything in common where we could right. begin to address what it is? But at the end of the day, it's that old story of, I don't think this agency or any emergency agency will be prepared to respond to all emergencies that happen all right. at once. Because there's no way, unless you want to have half a dozen ambulances, and then if we get a bus crash, we still can't respond to every patient that's involved in the bus. So you do well, the best you can for what you've got. But the discussion has to be that we as a South County subsidize our service for six hundred thousand right. dollars. And twenty percent of that responding to Greenfield, which does not subsidize their service at all, is not I mean that that's just not fair. I understand. I guess I'm, I'm I apologize. I was looking at the number of times the thirty six mutual aid calls that we had come into our community. Yep. Oh yeah. The thirty six times other agencies responded to our community to help us out. Right, so that's 36 times in six months? Correct. Right, so average six a month, yeah. but we're going out of our community 
20 much more of the than time, that. You know, so, yeah. To Greenfield. Right. And it's because they're not subsidizing their right. service. So, so it's not fair. Right. To that point, we need to have a discussion. Yes. And we've discussed it last time. We need to have a discussion with Greenfield. It's a, it's a capacity issue with Greenfield. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is, this is good. Right. It's so nice for me. Yeah. I think the, the, the three boards of selectmen need to get together and contact yeah. and, and it, I like now I love yes, making suggestions. Yeah, I love making those suggestions. I, that's fun, but 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 I really think that's that that that's a political thing that yeah. that that yeah. the boards would be much better handling than our board of oversight. I mean, yeah, it's definitely not. Oh no, yeah. yes, no. You, you know what I mean? And and, and and because and and I and, I, and He's he's right. It, it is a concern. Um, I'm still pretty amazed that we're averaging only six mutual aid calls a month. That's pretty damn good um, for the figure with our territories. Well, no, look at our territory. I mean, we, we cover a big territory, and 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 the three towns we we have what one seventh of one seventh the population of the entire county and. And we cover we cover a pretty pretty wide, wide swap, so yeah. I, I'm pretty. And we're, we're midway between two hospitals. It's not yeah. like Northampton where we've got a hospital yeah. in our community and we've got a quick turnaround. So right, so I'm pretty impressed. And, and most people, and, and because we're, where we live, most people aren't making. Fortunately, are no longer trying to drive themselves to the hospital. <clears throat> Have you had any impact? I only did it once. Which <laughs> <laughs> was in the last time. Exactly. In July? I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's come up. Um, well, July has been, at least it's, I don't have the numbers. It feels like it's been slow. And I don't think it's affected anything. We also, aside, of, aside from Morgan, I've done the administrative training for everyone else. All of them are starting their ride time either this week or Monday. So it hasn't really been playing a role into it that much yet. Um, um, yeah. Sorry. Okay. We interrupted this report. Sorry. Um, so, Stillwater Bridge we talked about. It's open again, which is wonderful. Everything's returned to normal. I thanked Greenfield and AMR for their help. And I don't think we actually ended up needing it, which is good. But I thank them for their availability. Um, if you see the last, I don't know if, it, if it's double sided. The second or the last page, there's the new standby schedule um, uh, somewhere in there. So, some of us can get the uh, second page. Yeah. The printer was being weird. Yeah, the printer's always being weird. Right, well, Zach's going to provide that. I'm going to skip ahead and I'll come back to that while he's printing out the new one. Can you just have yours, Tim? Okay. Can you just grab yours? Because it's already double sided. Thank you. Sure. So I'll skip ahead for that for the time being. Um, this goes back to overtime, which we've been discussed. Actually, no, it doesn't. Mine's double sided. <laughs> Equipment. So we've got our new medication pumps. We're working on training everybody for them right now. Um, it's a fantastic piece of equipment and it's gonna help make sure that we can give medications very accurately and it also gives us the option to give new medications. Um, so medications like IV nitro and levofed, which we couldn't give before, we can now give with these pumps because their dosing is just so precise we couldn't, we couldn't give it by basically eyeballing it like we did with other medications. Um, Everyone's going to be required to be trained in those pumps, and those will be in service hopefully by August 1st. Um, I've also been in touch with our training center, which is Community 911, about switching to check and inject epi kits. Instead of epi pens, which everyone's carried for forever, which cost hundreds, hundreds of dollars, um, these check and inject epi kits, they cost like, I don't know the exact number, tens of dollars. So we'll save a few hundred bucks, maybe a few thousand bucks a year on those. Um, there's a couple additional regulatory requirements but it's, the costs are covered by our training center and it doesn't really instill any extra cost on us. Um, we just have to make sure that our basics are signed off on them every six months, which the chief or their designee can do. It's not that big a deal. Um, That's great. What's the expiration on those? Okay. The bottles of epi that we'll be using in them will vary, but it's usually a year or two, depending on that. Um, and the epi pens are usually a year or two as well, but like I said, the biggest issue is they cost two to 300 bucks. Yeah. Um, which is a, a, yeah, a large part of our medication restock budget is those epi pens. Um, disappointing news is our new ambulance has been delayed because they came back with a what I consider a ridiculous quote from what they originally said um, of 
we expected somewhere around 375,000 and they came back at 420,000. So we're reaching out to other vendors and we're trying to get other quotes because that's just absurd for, compared to what they said originally, that's just not acceptable. <laughs> and I don't think the towns are gonna wanna spend that much money. Was there a reason provided why their cost went up as much as it did? Uh, when he reached out to me, he said that their new pricing came out uh, after the fiscal year changeover, um, <coughs> and that's their new numbers, and they can't even guarantee that they're that low. So, why is Troy looking for other vendors? There are cheaper vendors. PL Custom is a very good and reliable vendor that we've had good experience with, but if they're gonna take us for that much money, it doesn't feel worth. Like we need to look at other vendors. <laughs> um, and Zach is going to reach out as he's Zach's chair of the ambulance committee, so he's going to reach out and we'll start talking with other vendors and seeing what kind of numbers we can get. Well, we had always talked about right. We talked about sharing, you know, swapping boxes and and we can't that's do never, that's that never, Yeah, it's it's never really proven to be economical or. By the time it gets ready to do it, it's 10 or 15 years old and it's kind of used, used up its life expectancy, yeah, and right? That, that box is already at 2004, 2007, 2007. 2007. Um, and one of the reasons why it was proposed to replace it was that it is not up to the safety standards, it's not up to equipment standards and everything else. And so replacing that box onto another chassis not only would be putting something that is already 16 years old onto a new chassis and hoping it lasts another 10 years, um, but also then just takes all the current problems that are in that truck and just pushes them down the line and says, well, it'll be okay. Which is quite a few electrical gremlins at the moment. Yes, yeah. so it does some weird things. So. We, had, we had looked at that in the past, mm -hmm. and the challenge gets to be the trucks, we keep our trucks a long time. If you're in an urban environment where they're getting 200,000 miles on the chassis in two years, maybe, if you don't have salt on your roads, maybe. If it's great electrical, maybe. But the other challenge we ran into in investigating this is it was gonna take the truck out of service. At the time, I believe it was like four to six months. It's almost yeah. a year now. And it, the cost savings itself isn't really that I think high. it was only like $80,000 yeah. last time we looked it's, at it. It's yeah. less than $100,000 to just take that box and put it on a new chassis, which was doesn't truck, seem right? economical in anybody's idea. So. Yeah. Um, okay. So, when I get an update on that, I'll update all you guys on that stuff. Okay. Facilities and maintenance are, one of the garage doors broke, it took months to get the replacement spring, apparently that's a hard to get item. Um, we've since replaced that and everything's back to operational. We're switching to... How much was that? I haven't seen the invoice yet, so I'm not okay. sure. Yeah, because you know that's what our rental account for is for maintenance. That does explain why that account, okay. I did wonder that because that, the numbers in that account confused me a little bit. Okay. Um, but when I get that invoice, I'm guessing you haven't got it either. I have not. So I'll figure that one out. Um, we're going to save a few hundred bucks a year because we switched to buying deaf fluid in a big tub. We used to buy it in individual boxes and it's just, there's a more economical way to do it, which we've just switched over to doing. Um, and it should save us like 200 bucks a year, but the small numbers add up. How much deaf are we using? It's about 100 gallons a year. Um, I pulled the receipts okay. from Ka Carcrust um, from last year um, and did the math out. We spent about <coughs> 800 and some odd dollars just on DEF last year buying it in the boxes um, with buying a little cart for the tank to go on so that we can actually move the thing around. And the jug itself um, will go through about one a year, maybe one and a half to two a year, depending on when we buy it and how it uh, gets cycled. Um, and it will save us about 200 bucks working those numbers out. Just keep an eye on, are we air conditioned out in those space? We are not. Uh, I did speak with the gentleman over there about the actual storage of it. Okay. Uh, they said somewhere between eight to nine months is perfectly fine. Okay. And then looking at the math on how much we're actually using in that period of time, um, we're actually gonna use more than what we purchased. Okay, so Perfect. it did seem like a, a reasonable thing to do. What's good? Zach? Diesel exhaust, Diesel exhaust fluid. Exhaust fluid. So uh, the emission standards in 2014 require that all vehicles have that filter in them, mm -hmm. um, which uses a f ammonia type uh, fluid. Yeah. And so that uh, fluid has to get added to our trucks pretty and regularly. If it gets too hot, the ammonia starts to break down and mm -hmm. yeah. you've got to watch it. So that's why my question is about 
how long and how much. Mm-hmm. And we do watch the temperature in those bays in um, the summer months anyways, because our medications also have those types of uh, requirements, requirements on it. So they should be, should okay. all kind of work out okay. Perfect, thank you. Um, and I said Unit 103 was out of service at the moment, but it actually just came back. The exhaust issue was fixed, which is good for everyone. Um, and our other truck's gonna have to go out next preventive maintenance for brakes, but it's not an urgent thing. So we'll deal with that when that comes up. Um, and as I stunt st- for personnel, like I said, Morgan is working on getting cleared. We'll get her 30 AS- ALS calls as soon as we can and we'll get her on the truck. Um, and our three per DMs will be cleared, hopefully by the middle of next month, if not sooner. It depends on how active they are picking up shifts. Um, and the other issue is with having four people training right now, we put a toll on our training officers. So pretty much all of their shifts are full with training somebody extra. Um, so we're going to get them cleared as quickly as we're operationally able to. Um, and this just goes back into me taking people off of A2 to cover A1 shifts to prevent overtime. Um, and then David Zamoyski's retirement gathering is still scheduled for this Saturday here at the station, 1 to 5, for anyone who's interested in attending. Um, Where the be? Hmm? Where? Right about here. We haven't. We're waiting to figure out a few final details to figure out if it's going to be like more over here, or more over there, right? In the bays. Yeah. The um, but we're just waiting for a couple of things. Yeah, it's always supposed to rain now, unfortunately. So, 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 Tempo, good information. Um, how how does how does a um, we just review? So, I don't know, Crystal and and Fred. But when South County's out on a call, dispatch knows when we have an impact shift or not have an impact shift. So if the impact shift is staffed with two people, then we call control and tell them that we have two trucks on. Um, if the impact shift is staffed with one person, we usually don't call control and tell them that there's only one person on because it doesn't really, they're still starting mutual aid. So it doesn't really benefit us to call and do that. Sure. Um, but that's usually how it operates. Um, and then if myself or whoever the chief would be would be here to make that second person, then we would call control and notify them that we were available to do it. Um, if you don't have an impact shift, so if you don't don't have an impact shift, um, control knows. And how, 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 what's your average response when you're using mutual aid? The average time to a scene when you're using mutual aid? Hmm. I would have to run those numbers. I have the numbers from all the calls in the office. I would just have to run them. Um, but it's got to be at least 15 minutes, I would say. Okay. And, and, and so, so instead of seven, you're looking at 15. Yeah, and again, that's a rough guess, but that's my. Uh, I, yeah, that, that, that's fine for right now. I, and again, I just I just wanted. And it, so there there is a procedure. You know, they they run they run through a procedure, but there is a, it is slightly delayed. Yes. Okay. And if there is one person mm-hmm. here in the past with courage, take the yeah, truck and, and go begin care, even if you got to transfer it to a mutual aid. And the chart doesn't specify, the chart that I created doesn't specify what we have for staffing, but you'll see that some of them say A2 responded with one. Um, now sure. again, some of those mutual aid calls may have been because both trucks were out in that. Right. I would have to look even closer at the numbers for that, but there's quite often that at least one person can be able to respond, sure. um, which is definitely better than none. <laughs> sure. Um, and then back to my standby schedule, now that you all have a copy of it. So Zach helped you run the numbers with this that basement. Wasn't in the, uh, you didn't this. I thought you took the whole thing. Nope, I just took oh. the director's report. There all right. Copies of the... Standby. So let me go down one more rabbit hole with you. Uh, sure. So if we have a third person, but we don't have a fourth, you get the first truck is out, you get the second call. So. Argument's sake, it's you who responds with the second truck. You get on scene. Mutual aid shows up. It's a basic truck. You're a paramedic. Patient needs paramedic level care. So the state would require at that point that I have st- if I have started ALS care, I cannot downgrade care to those providers. Right. So what I've done in the past, and I don't know if this was the most kosher answer or not, Greenfield Fire came in and they drove me and my truck with all my ALS gear to the hospital, and then they followed me to the hospital in their as well. Truck. But None of the paramedics here are going to be downgrading. Like we're not going to pass off a sick person to people who are not capable of handling that sick person. There's a number of moral and possibly legal issues with that. Okay. It's also rare to get a double basic crew right. coming in mutually. Okay. Um, that being said, I have heard 
AMR semi. AMR is the only one. Yeah, basic trucks. AMR mm -hmm. is always going to have a paramedic. Usually, Northampton will always have a paramedic. Correct. Okay. It's only if we get a BLS AMR truck, Greenfield or Conway, that we would be expecting to see a basic. Right. I just I appreciate the answer because I wanted to make sure that we're continuing the paramedic level of care if we've started it. And the other thing is, while some people may not see it as a big deal to pull the keys and leave the ambulance sitting on the side of the road, I know sometimes it can be difficult locking all the cabinets to make sure everything inside is secure. We so. would fully support that if practical. The issue with providing ALS care is that once you start providing ALS care, you have to have all of your ALS gear with you okay. um, because you can't anticipate like just because the patient seems like they're stable and you're not going to be like, I won't need the intubation kit. All of a sudden, they could, you could need the intubation kit. Sure. So this is where these issues arise. And <clears throat> to my knowledge, and maybe stuff happened that I just didn't know about when I wasn't in charge, but to my knowledge, we've never had an issue arise. But that's why when I had that situation, I had Greenfield drive my truck because okay. that was, I couldn't downgrade care. Yeah, perfect. I have a donor police respond at the same time can they drive so no the state well no is the best answer um there's currently a waiver in place for first responders to make the rest of an ambulance crew i disagree with this because it's not they're not trained to operate on an ambulance and when a situation comes up where we have a really sick patient and i need additional help in the back those people require very specific direction. It's the same reason why South County doesn't hire brand new EMT basics, because they're just not experienced enough to know what to do in those situations. And this isn't me, like the police department is wonderful and they can certainly drive us when there's two people and we have a very bad patient, but it puts a lot of risk on us to have the police department like make that second crew member, um, which is why we also don't have like first responder fire departments make that second crew member, because it's just, it's a lot of liability. Um, because if I if I have to ask someone like a police officer to bag the patient, and honestly, there's quite a few police officers around here that are pretty good at that. But if they don't know how to do it, then now I'm in a situation where I have to provide other care for the patient, and the patient Sorry. needs to be breathed. Like someone needs to breathe for them, and now I can't do that. And it's just also it's a skill that you need to be trained, and not just any lay person to bag the right. patient appropriately. Right. You it's, have to be certified in order to bag the patient. So the short answer is. Yes, the long answer is it's just, it's not something I've ever been comfortable with. And, right, and it's, they would have to be on our ambulance license as well. Um, okay. So, and the, you, were, you were talking about, I'm gonna use you because. Yeah, that's, well, that's what I'm here for. You're a single person, you respond to a call because you don't have an alternative and you're looking for assistance. Somebody's gonna, a mutual aid is gonna come. Mm -hmm. uh, because Deerfield, it, it, if it's not a case where you have somebody who, it's a normal call, whatever a normal call is, right. and you don't need two people in the back of the bus. If a police officer is there to drive, is it's that okay? Still, it's still, it's a high risk thing because what can seem like a normal patient can quickly devolve into non-normal patient. Yeah, but I'm talking about a situation where you have one person, right? and if the mutual aid doesn't come, Mutual aid is always going to come. Yeah, I mean, but they might, they might not come in 15 minutes, whereas you have a police officer who's there in two minutes, and you're 10 minutes away from a hospital. I'm just trying to figure this out. Yeah, but if it's a, if it's a, also, if, we'll use your example. If it's a non critical <coughs> patient, right. waiting for the mutual aid ambulance is will, better. will still always be better and safer, because even okay. something as simple as driving the ambulance, the police department doesn't do very often. Right. And the nuances behind braking and operating it and moving a 12,000 or whatever, 18,000 pound vehicle, sure. it's just it's just not safe in my eyes. Mm -hmm. You don't um, want to be in the back yeah. with somebody who can't drive. No, no, I, I'm that. just, yeah, yeah I'm, I have no problems. I'm <laughs> just asking questions here. Hey, hey, yeah. No, I appreciate I the question. Yeah. Yeah. Tim, yeah. Tim and Tim, I like the discussion. But be, and, and again, ha having these discussions is good because we, we hear these questions in out in the public. And, and we have, and then, then though that what well, information that we gain here, then we can relay. I like the discussion. I, I those are good questions. Um, I, I mean, see Gary, Gary and Matt may, and Crystal have, may have different because they've ridden the bus. Yeah. I haven't. Fred, I have. Kim, and so we haven't. So listening to your, listening to what the discussion to me is a worthwhile, is a worthwhile yeah. listen. I, I I I really and I, and I like your I like your I like your answers, Tim. I, I think because I, I think 
um, what it, there, there's there's a perce- sometimes there's a perception of what can be done, right. and but I like his freedom that he's responding. I like that. I, I, I think it's a great discussion to have. So do you have? Uh, did you have a question? I do related to this. So if this is the case, we're using the example that Tim's responding by himself as a paramedic. There have been opportunities where there are other paramedics who do live in our community. Zach and I, myself, are two examples. Sometimes, prior, we have been contacted or we're listening to the radio, we get calls on our phones, then a call comes out, we know there's one person on a truck. We are able, if available, to respond and be that second person on the truck. I guess the question which we've spoken about is the call pay, like responding off duty and being that second person on the truck. I mean, what we've always done historically is if you respond off duty, you get paid overtime. Okay. Yeah, so that answers part of question. And, that's like, yeah. and that, that creates a, that, that washes the one hand, like if we respond for a call, even if it's a met, a met like that, we still pay for the, that overtime with that call without it really being an issue. And I would say, like, we kind of talked about it a little briefly, but like in the last month or so, there's been five, I think, times off duty that myself or another paramedic has come back to a scene, right? Whether they needed extra assistance, whether it was a cardiac arrest or something like that, where they needed extra people, or it was a single person on A2 that needed a crew to be made. Um, and then I'm getting paid two hours of overtime or whatever it may be to be there. That never gets reflected when my pay sheet goes across whoever's, you know, yeah. the table. Uh, and so those are things, and I'll, I'll say just from my own personal view on it, right? When the overtime question was continuing to come, I felt personally at least, um, well, I just, I, then I won't come back, right? Like if I'm gonna yeah. be singled out as like, a, well, my overtime's really high, then why? Maybe they don't want me to come back kind of a question, right? Except that if those two hours are reflected in, the, in your in your pay sheet. They're in my pay sheet, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So um, you shouldn't feel bad. No, so I think from a board standpoint, and I'll, yeah. I'll say this just for me personally, I'm around often. I tend to be on a lot of those calls at times. Um, but if from a board standpoint, we say the statement of absolutely we should have those second people making those trucks and that's never going to be a conversation or a, a question or a whatever, then absolutely um, we can make some of those things happen. But we do have to realize that's overtime. It's multiple hours of overtime and it's those types oh, yeah, of things, yeah, right? Yeah, but that's reflected in your time sheet. Sure. sure. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I'll say this and if we need to vote on it, we can vote on it absolutely positively if you're available to make that second person to get that patient yeah, to the hospital no do not worry about the cost of the overtime go do what you need to do and don't let it impede your treatment or decisions about whether we go to franklin or bay state because we're worried about no you take care you put the patient care first take care of the patient first we'll deal with the financial fallout afterwards all we're asking i think all i would ask as you're doing those monthly reports, track what it's for. Right. And when we see two hours to make second person on backup ambulance. Matt, I see it every two weeks. Okay. okay. I'll go fight I'll fight all day with the finance and, committee and on that. Not, yeah. And that's not the issue. I, I totally understand yeah. that. I'm just saying it as a person who's sitting here and a resident and a employee yeah. here of somebody who's often on those things. Okay. Um, that is that's just my statement there. That if we all. get if we get to a point where we're fighting about that, we got bigger issues. Totally understand yeah, I, and agree. Yeah, with I that. think that, that in the discussion that occurred. Okay. Past, no, I figured that, but I just want to make it I'm not even bringing that up there. Had nothing to do with an instance like that. I, totally. I think it was a generic the numbers didn't didn't go down like we were told they were gonna go down. It wasn't about any individual care decision that was ever made no. because nobody wants uh, and you know, an understaffed truck to be the reason why somebody dies or somebody has a stroke or somebody, you know, that's once you're in a critical care situation, do what you need to do, and, and everybody wants that. I, I'm sure. I so. totally respect and understand that. It wasn't even a question of last year's budget season. Yeah. This is just a today as we're looking going forward, looking at overtime and expecting this from Tim at least, right, to, to yeah. function and uh, do these things. Yeah. Um, 
I just wanted I, to make I just it, wanted that understood. Yeah, that I just wanted to make it known that that is a possibility that there's, I think, well, almost half the almost half the department does live in our service area out of the three towns. There's at least so there is yeah, opportunity counting per diems and full time staff. a second truck if there five is to seven. one person oh, on, which is a yeah. great thing because. And I mean, I, there's people that live in our service area. I so. encourage a communication. I mean, if, if somebody lives outside of the service area, they happen to be in Greenfield, you're shopping at BJ's, you hear the tones, we're going mutually to Greenfield, they may not have a second, get on the phone, call the other person, hey, I'm in Greenfield, yeah. I can respond, and we pay them for their showing up and doing the call. Whatever we need to do, yeah. when those tones go off, take care of the patients. Yeah, but I, that's why we need the data to go back to our finance committees and know Right. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we, this I type of this I type of overtime been. isn't in question, but we don't know how much of the overtime right. is this and how much is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I just to continue my, my education. You mentioned uh, that you have. Do you have basics in in the per diem staff? I mean, do you ever use a basic? We so we do have basics in the per diem staff. We have at the moment three, and with the two more that were hired, we have five. Um, Basics are great, but like has been, I think it's been said before, the, the biggest issue with basics is they're great for the per diem truck because that lets us fill that truck. Um, but when we put them on the full time truck, if, right. yeah, if the paramedic calls out, then it becomes a problem. Um, but having the basics fill the, sorry, having the basics on the per diem truck is very beneficial and it often lets us make two paramedic trucks. So let's say, for example, we have basic A and basic B both pick up the impact shift. Mm -hmm. and then we have two paramedics on the full time truck, we split that truck for the duration of that impact shift and make two paramedic trucks to serve our That's what area. I was trying to understand, is yeah. how, how you, you know, sometimes you'd have two paramedics on a truck and it, sometimes you don't. Right, so that if, if we try, and there's always gonna be exception to the rule, but we try to never run that second truck as a double basic truck, we try to always have two medic trucks. Right. There can that be exceptions to that, like we had a call where me and Alicia went mutual aid for a very sick sounding person. So both of us as the medics hopped on to go to that town and we left the, the truck. As, it was the MCA. Yeah, we left the truck as double basic. Right. But for the most part, we just keep it like for that impact shift, there'll be a, two, a medic and a basic truck and we'll run right. it like that. Right. Um, While I think we all want to strive to provide a paramedic level truck on every single call, when you're in that situation, you're calling for help, it's better to get something than nothing. And I'm not disparaging basics because for those right. of us who are providers, most of us started at the basic level. And hopefully, with the basics working here, they're encouraged and they're given the support. But, you know, if they choose to, move up to become a paramedic. But, you know, if you dial 911 because you've got an emergency, you're not asking the person coming across the door, you're basically you're a paramedic. You want somebody to begin providing help. And if the basics can't provide that higher level of care, they can provide a level of care, get you on the ambulance, and start you moving towards a hospital, or and you know for a paramedic intercept along the way, right. or get you to the hospital safely, mm -hmm. so that they right. can begin advanced levels. That's good knowledge because I, you know, was under the impression that, um, you know, you had two trucks and there were four paramedics, so on the impact shift you've got, you know, four full-time staffers. Filling that, whereas that's not the case. I, I, it, yeah, it depends. Yeah, it depends. It can there, be, there's sometimes where that's the case. There's sometimes where it's not the case. It right. depends on the day. It depends on staffing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's good. I just uh, you know, for, I long, ask for a long for long time. It's more education, understanding how this uh, operation works. Basics. We're getting a rap as being chauffeurs or taxi drivers, and right. they're much more than taxi yeah, drivers. Basics can do a lot, especially with the expanded can. protocols and. There's a lot that basics can do yes. compared to how it was even five years ago. When I first started, their basic scope of practice has expanded way beyond right. what I did 10 years ago. And there are some basics out there who may not be able to practice as a paramedic, but their experience and skills are phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And given the opportunity or the ability, for whatever reason, to be able to go back to school, and there's they would ace it. This is a conversation we could have down the road. There are departments who will encourage their per diems to go to medic school by offering to pay for that, and you sign an agreement saying you'll work four shifts a month or something, and we agree to pay for your school, and if you violate that, you pay it back or something. And that's something we could certainly like discuss as far as like making people more active. Sure. But 
know it has mixed success at certain departments. Mm -hmm. Well, why don't you write up a proposal and, and, and get it to us? I'll look into it. All right. Spare time. Because we we yeah. we, no, we, I, well, we, we have we have we, we, we do that with our police. Uh, we've done it in the past. So my part-time job in Hatfield, they have that same thing. I can reach out to him and ask how they structure their stuff and see. Make a presentation. Yeah. Um, anyway, the standby fees. If we're all set to move on. Yeah. Um, so me and Zach worked on this based on the cost that it costs to run the ambulance out that door, and then I averaged the overtime that we would spend to staff this truck. How it had been before, we had offered. Uh, two tiers of service. We'd offered to have a VLS standby and an ALS standby, and that's just not practical because all of our standbys almost exclusively are being staffed by ALS paramedics on overtime. So we were offering to a VLS standby that somebody could buy for $15 an hour, and our average offset cost for overtime is $55 an hour. So I've removed that option as a whole because it doesn't, like, we're just throwing money out the door at that point. Um, so, and I included two rates one that's much closer to our operating cost for if the high school or some a town entity where we're just moving money back and forth so like is a little bit lower and then there's the private rate which is a little bit higher to help offset those administrative costs um but all the costs went up pretty a lot from what they were before probably like 50 to 60 percent and that just helps the, the old costs weren't reflecting our overtime expenses very well and these costs will at least cover the cost of doing business. Do you have, in your cost for your paramedics, do you have benefits, retirement? That I don't have. Um, okay, because we've got to build in all those Right, um, I added costs. an extra $10 for miscellaneous administrative fees. I would need, I don't know who the person to ask for to help me understand that number. Well, if, 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 you're doing, if, if, you, if most of your SART are working overtime mm -hmm. to begin with, the overtime doesn't doesn't affect those costs. Your health care is already your health care is based on your forty hour your forty hour and, and so so your is there retirement that goes in on overtime? Your retirement not based on overtime. It's just your straight time. Yeah. Regular and reoccurring. It's your, uh, regular Medicare, and Medicaid. So all, all straight time. All straight time. Yeah. Taxes. Straight time. Taxes are not, but those are coming That's, out yeah. of right. the employer uh, employees check. Right. Yeah, so so municipal in the municipal realm, your all your benefits are based on your forty. Okay. So so you you would they wouldn't necessarily have to have to be added into. So could you explain how these these would be provided? So this is an hourly rate. Yes. So it's like you were a non dedicated single provider uh, going for four hours. This would be. Right. Multiply by four. Yes. Yeah, so it'd be sixty five or seventy depending on the service dollars an hour divide, or times four. Um, and I mean, there's questions to be had, and I don't know what the right answer is about if we have like a minimum of like, like if it's two hours, do we need to have a minimum to offset those costs a little more? I don't, yeah. I, I need to look into that further. Um, well, do you, do you have, when you have people come on overtime for, for a detail like that, are, are you telling them there's a minimum two hour call? Four hour call, three hour call, one hour. So those people are always paid hourly. So if they if a call comes in and Zach's working the standby and he's scheduled the standby for three hours, but then he does a transport and it takes five hours, he's getting paid the, that full five hours. Mm -hmm. um, because we're also entitled to the revenue we get from that transport. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that should more than offset his costs. Um, I guess the question would be if we build into the schedule or we build into the rate, assuming there's a transport, like. Zach is scheduled for three hours. We build in an extra hour for transport in case that happens so that we can. Well, I think you need to build in something for, because again, so say, you know, Treehouse wants three hours of coverage. Someone's going to get here. You're probably going to have them coming here half right. an hour before, right. half an hour to get back. So I think you need to build in something extra just for that. Yeah, you have to have a minimum call, right? You know, minimum call. All time, but right. look, look at that, and and, and because it, you've got to remember also, you don't supply an ambulance for one person. Right, and that's mm -hmm. so historically things like the old Jeep craft fair and stuff like that. All they want to pay for is one person with an AED and a first aid bag to sit there. So that's why these options exist because there's a lot of organizations that want that. So we send one person up with that, 
if they want the full ambulance, that's the price is reflected for the full sun transport, full staff, yeah, fully staff transporting ambulance. Then it goes up to, for a dedicated ALS ambulance, $160 an hour, or for a BLS ambulance, because even though we're staffing it with paramedics, they can still be operating out of our third BLS truck. So we're not going to charge them for that ALS gear that we're not using. So it's a little bit less in that realm. Um, the question, and I have a hard time doing this because I'm not an accountant or a business, like I'm learning this, is if I'm charging enough for these ambulances. I've done the, the math for the maintenance, I've done the math for the overtime, I've done the math for the expected fuel costs. And like I said, I've added a little bit of administrative fee to cover that end, but I just don't know if it's high enough. You'll never, you'll never charge enough to handle the Deerfield administrative fees. They are outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, I, I right now, you, you just give us your best. You, you give, and you give, you give us some, You just give us your best. Okay. And it's really a number thing. It's not like you're trying. You're not trying to buy an ambulance off from it. What you're trying to do is just cover. Most important is you're covering the cost of your people that are working. Mm -hmm. And right. also providing some, you know, regular opportunities mm -hmm. for your staff to yeah, absolutely, and, to <coughs> shift and you know, right. keep them local and right. Um, but going forward, I'll, I'll I'll try to figure out what our our minimum should be, and I think it should be an hour beforehand. Historically, in the past, we've always, and I don't I don't know if so we build it this way or not, but. We've always, like if a, a detail is booked from four to midnight, we've always had people come in at three. So you have an hour to check your truck, you have extra time to get there. Because just because they step, like they don't want you showing up right at four o'clock. They want you there and ready right. for your job. Right, so that's why I was like your first hour really should be a two hour rate. And right. then your rate drops per hour afterwards. If that kind of, because, so if you said your first hour, you know, and I'll just round this up. For this basic was $100. And then it dropped to fifty dollars for each additional hour. That covers your coming in before getting everything there. So I mean, that's it, another it way to look at right, it too. It before and after. Right. When you bring a truck back, do you have to uh, offload medications or anything like so that? So we have to. Not that we don't necessarily have to do that, but often we bring a truck back there. But what you gotta fill it up with gas. You gotta fill up with gas. Stuff, would, you clean. would normally be expected to clean the truck clean and leave it in yeah. good condition. Right. So there should be some time built in before and after, I would right. say. Yeah, and that's why I think I would do yeah, that first sure. hour. Yeah. A double rate. And then well, that's why I was wondering as we the, when we talked about it before, we, we said maybe we should be charging a minimum of $350. Or, you know, if we if we say a three hour a three hour call out is gonna cost this much, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I, I don't know how people, do, do people want to uh, be told, well, it's going to cost you $65 an hour to have us staff this thing. And then they're going to start arguing about, well, it was only here two and a half hours. Well, no, you got the hour before and a half hour afterwards to take care of the ambulance. Right, right. right. and that's why I think you just jack up that first yeah. hour price, because then that becomes transparent to the person hiring you, right? Right. Then they, and they also think they're getting a deal on each additional hour instead of, yeah, I mean, that's a good way to think about it that I did not consider. Um, this is great, so thank you for doing this. The other, the other piece of this is, do we want to allow people the opportunity to just have one provider? Right. Or are we sending, if you ask, if you require medical coverage, we're going to send two providers in an ambulance. Right. Um, I guess the question will end up being in, is if they will just, well, actually, I say this, but I don't think any of my time at a private service, I ever did a standby with just myself. I'm trying to remember if when I worked at other companies that that were the case. So what, what, so, all right, Tim, what can you do by yourself? Can you, can you? You can provide a first uh, it, aid. Uh, you're, 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 you're doing basic first aid. Correct. You're not, you're not providing paramedic level service. Correct. I mean, you, it's, well, it's you a valid point worth consideration. Assessment. Yes, and I can do a paramedic assessment by myself. I can do CPR and I can put an AD on and I can do all this other stuff. Um, and I can initiate care while we're waiting for the ambulance. The question with us requiring an ambulance is if somebody just doesn't end up hiring anyone. If that's, like if we, if we instead of throwing $55 an hour at them, throw $140 an hour at them, if they're like, well, like our guys have a first aid kit like this is good enough and i guess that's the question that we right so you to. take deerfield craft fair as an example would they actually pay more than you know that single provider well, or would they just say we don't want anybody 
And now we're... Do they come to the town and request a permit for that event? Uh, that I don't know. Yeah, yes, I mean, it could be a condition of, you want to do something of this scale in this town, this is a requirement. Right. In addition right. to the fees, yeah. which we waive, or what if we don't waive them? Right. This We require this in case somebody has a medical emergency. Yeah. Right, and they it's don't have optional. to, I don't think we can force them to hire us, but they just have to hire yeah. an ambulance. Right, yeah. exactly. And you could probably set standard of care and say it has to be, you know, PLS or ALS, and say, hire whoever you want. When your toilet's plugged and you call the plumber, you get charged at first rate. He doesn't, you don't just get the plumber, you get the plumber and the truck and the equipment, mm -hmm. and, and you're not saying to him, don't bring, don't bring all the other stuff. Ellen need you to bring the fancy snake to rotor root of the yeah, toilet. That, that's yeah, that's a very valid point. Yeah. <laughs> Just bring the plunger. Don't bring the yeah. snake. Yeah, you know they're coming with the full truck and the full amount of gear, and you're going to get hit for an hour or whatever their minimum rate is. So this what? is a good starting point, though. I mean, oh, obviously no. the chief, the new chief is going to, you know, work with us to set this policy. Yeah. But it's, it's I, I'm I glad think we're having a discussion. I think we probably need to work together as a group to set this sooner, and then as a new chief comes in, yeah. they can review it, and I think we talked about potentially putting an expiration date on it every year, so we need to re review it, and we adjust prices accordingly. Right. And I don't. I reached out, D2R2, and we may have already billed at the old rate, I just emailed them today, because they're already on our schedule, and I have no idea what happened, so I emailed her today to ask if we already sent her an invoice, or if we haven't, and then... Alicia is going to meet with Treehouse on Friday about their half marathon. Um, okay. So I would like to provide them with a bill that at least covers our costs, um, even if it means we give them a temporary one and we can adjust it to higher or so later. But I'll, mm. I will adjust this and email it to you guys for review before um, mm. Friday, so that we can at least I can at least send Alicia with an accurate bill that will at least cover our costs. Good. All right. Um, Good discussion. Next up. I think that's it for my report. Okay. On, on the ambulance, I know we're living on borrowed time with the third truck. So as you're speaking with providers or manufacturers and getting quotes, if you could ask them or make sure what the bill time is. And I'm not, I'm not advocating for paying the increase that we've been hit with, but I also don't want to be in a situation where instead of being two years, now it's going to be three years and we wind up with a dead truck and we got to do something interim in the middle that I have uh, I've spoken to four different manufacturers so far just like emails out I'd like to chat with somebody and send me the person to talk to okay. um, a couple of them have reached back out we obviously got the initial quote from our current manufacturer that we have used in the past uh, one other manufacturer reached out and invited us down to their office to chat about um, what their numbers and such looked like. Um, coordinating that with them so that we can do that. Okay. Um, and another one also came back and said that they were going to be at a conference, which I don't think is reasonable to kind of invest that amount of time to go down there. But um, they said that they do have a couple demo type trucks that might exist and they have um, about a year build time which is consistent to PL kind of as they sit right now um, and so once I have kind of even rough numbers from any of them I'll obviously bring it to Tim and okay. we can bring it to the board together whichever way um, so that we can all have an idea but I definitely agree if we wait six months from now we may be four hundred and eighty thousand dollars and not four hundred twenty I just don't know because they change their prices when they want to change their prices yeah so I'm working as fast as I can to get them to it's, give me numbers. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Fuel has come down. I'm hearing uh, imports where containers were costing tens of thousands of dollars to get in. Now they're closer to $1,000 a container to bring in. So costs have been coming down, but it's the old gasoline game. Jack it up as soon as it goes up and then take forever to bring the prices down as costs come down. So. And they, they are, um, every single person I've spoken to so far has said all their uh, original numbers are contingent on what Ford's new pricing is or whoever the vehicle manufacturer's new pricing is mm -hmm. um, because they didn't buy any stock last year, obviously, that sure. they're going to carry over. Um, and so I think that's kind of a number they're waiting on as well. Um, I have a feeling that whatever number they give me is probably going to be contingent on a vehicle price or a, a manufacturer or something like that. Uh, but the final price is usually like basically set when we sign the paperwork, isn't it? Yes, as long as there's no big contingencies in there. Right. Uh, the current <clears throat> quote that we got back had a pretty big contingency of like $30,000 in it, 
which I'm not crazy comfortable with, and, and I don't and think anybody it, else is. So. 420 plus 30? No, it was 390 with contingent to 420. And he said uh, it could still go higher than that yes. 420 as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was expected to go higher by the final project, or do you, the final end date. Do you know when Ford, they changed their model year and they stopped building the chassis at some point. Do we know when that point is? I believe it's mid to late summer, so right around where we are a little later. Okay, and they so start releasing them sometime in that August or September. Was September. Um, but we don't really know, and they also may have a backtrack of, you know, they start getting them in July or August or whatever that I'm not, you know, I don't see on the public front. Uh, my hope behind it is that we can get something that's relatively non-contingent with some pretty straight numbers in it. So if it is a little bit more than we expected just because that's where prices went, at least all of us together can have a better idea of where that number is really going to be and we can make that decision at that point. Are we... We're looking at a pickup front. Yes. F? 550. 550. Yeah. Is it all of these? And it comes, comes with it. It comes standard as an ambulance package. So they sell it to you as a, cha a truck, chassis, truck right? chassis, so it's a front cab and then just um, frame behind that with four wheels in the back of it. Okay. Um, the one thing we discovered with the 450s is they're questionably rated for the amount of weight that we put on it once we put all our equipment on the trucks. And so that's why everybody's gone to 550s from there. I think that's not a question. Okay. Um, there are other manufacturer options. They're all the same price or more expensive. The Fords have worked pretty good for us. They are all diesel. Um, get better idle times from a diesel engine. Uh, diesel engine lasts longer idling. With the amount of idling we do on a vehicle just to oh, keep yeah. AC or uh, heat on, um, the engine itself lasts longer. Kind of just I'm just curious so, yeah. because I, 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 I doubt that the state would do something like mandate that after X time we're not gonna let you burn diesel anymore. Yeah. You know, these things could happen, you know, crazy stuff. It's true, so, I mean, they make an electric one. Yeah. Uh, it's like nine hundred thousand yeah. dollars. So I don't think we're in that market yeah. right now. But yeah. um, um, yeah. on the are those truck chassis? Are they on the state bid, or do we buy those? My understanding, and I, I have gotten a couple mixed messages. I have I have not been involved in it previous to now. Uh, okay. My involvement in it now is that I do all the maintenance on the vehicles, and I'm kind of on top of those. So um, that's my involvement in it now. My understanding is that the manufacturers are under state bid or the, the dealers themselves are under state bid, which makes it so that you can buy them from them um, without having to go out to bid and get it back is my um, my, my understanding of it. Um, so it's not the chassis itself, the manufacturer is buying that chassis and then selling it to you as their type one ambulance. Right. Or, or If you have a couple ambulance. minutes, yep. I believe it's um, Mark Hutz in Holyoke, Mark Hutt Ford. Mm -hmm. Mark Hutt Ford in Holyoke, they've got a pretty big commercial truck division Call and ask them when the cutoff is for the 550 that we're looking for. The model year, yeah. Um, just to get some information from him, because if we're hearing, and I don't know if he'll tip his hand, you know, our price is going to go up next year, does it pay for us to buy the chassis now? Well, the question would also be if they would even work on that chassis that's like... So we've run into this. Uh, that was a question that was asked by myself, Zoe, and David okay. prior to us actually forming the committee. Um, a lot of manufacturers won't let you buy a chassis first and then send it to them because they want to deal with they want to get it exactly when they want it and they'll actually charge you money to take in your chassis oh, and possibly true. store it for the period of time until they're ready to start building it um, is my understanding just from those kind of back room conversations that we're having um, and so it seems as though saving five thousand dollars on up front to just go to marcotte or somebody yeah. else and buy that chassis would actually probably cost you more because you're going to end up paying them their money in the end that's the way we used to do it years ago i, I have no doubt at all yeah I'm, I'm just trying to kind of circle around and get the best deal for our money <clears throat> okay so to, to make sure you put that on our agenda for next time i'll try and have some numbers and such yeah, together for you go um all of the people you're talking to are within the Massachusetts procurement system. Yeah, so I they're reached all out. probably going to be roughly the same because you know. Oh, uh, there's some of them that are way more expensive than others, and there's yeah. some of them that are way cheaper than others. Oh, good. That's yeah. a good. In, hopefully, reasonably, PL has been wonderful to us 
for the last two trucks and they've actually been in the middle ground of price right okay. we didn't buy the most expensive we didn't buy the cheapest we kind of stayed in the middle that's yeah. lasting well um awesome. and everyone so, around here has pl now which may be part of true. the problem yeah. yeah um but all of the manufacturers you know i reached out to pl customs and they send me their salesperson or mm -hmm. like the division that is in our area that has our bid that's how right. all those manufacturers work okay life um, packs any word on the life packs I haven't heard anything. Uh, I got a notification about Lucas's that they had been added to our account a little while ago. Life packs were substantial months away and we okay. haven't gotten an update. I did talk to our rep about um, actually a quote on an AED because we have one that's expiring and that's uh, one of the things that we had chatted about. And he had said that his system was down and he would get back to me this week. So I'm okay. expecting to hear something from him this week. Fair enough, thank you. Uh, job posting for EMS chief search committee. You got you got the job posted, or it, it we will be posting it. All right. So we'll start next. We'll have the search committee make up on their next meeting. Okay. Yep. Um. We had new business. South Deerfield Fire EMT. Have we discussed that yet? No. So. Tim hasn't gotten a call back. I can give you a brief like uh, overview of the the context and the situation. It's a very complicated situation and I think it could be beneficial. So to back up a little bit, South Deerfield Fire offered a few years ago, I'm not sure entirely when, that their two full-time EMTs they have on staff would be willing to help make the second member on that impact truck so we could respond to calls. Um, there's quite a few regulatory things that need to be jumped through for that to happen and we're, we're happy to do it. It's just a matter of figuring out there's a bunch of costs that South Deerfield Fire is going to have to incur and there's some costs that we're going to have to incur and South Deerfield is going to have to change how they're currently acting. They're currently, they have EMTs, but in the eyes of the law, they're not EMTs, they're first responders because their affiliation agreement with the hospital says that they're first responders and they need to change to EMTs, which requires additional training and oversight stuff that responsibilities that they'll have to be willing to take on. And then there's the fact that in the eyes of the state, South Deerfield's fires, EMTs are not our employees. Um, so we'd have to have some sort of memorandum of agreement and there'd have to be some changes to our ambulance license. It's all very doable. And I spoke to Matt from Community Member One, who's pretty much an expert in all these regulations. He said, we can certainly do it. We just, he would like to lay out for us the entire process and everyone needs to be a willing participant in it because it's gonna be a little bit complicated. Um, but I don't think it's the worst idea in the world to have them join us. The issues that I would have is their level of experience. Depending on the personnel, their level of experience could be problematic because like I said, we don't hire new EMTs. And like the, one of the guys over there has a ton of experience and one of them has essentially no experience as an EMT. So it's just a comfort level for that. And when I was speaking to Matt, he would also say, said that they would need to complete our orientation program and be certified like to our level of standing, which could mean doing anywhere between five to 30 calls with us um, just because they don't have medical controls it is. So we need to prove to Bay State that these people are capable of being EMTs. And this would be a Bay State requirement, not like even a South County requirement. Bay State, when you operate as an EMT, you operate on the physician's license and mm -hmm. the physician wants proof that you're reliable. Like they can trust you to operate on their license. So usually the less experience you have, the higher the requirement they set is. So for like one of the guys over there has a ton of experience. He's probably not gonna have that high of a requirement. The guy with almost no experience as a transporting EMT is gonna have a higher requirement. So it's just, there's a lot of numbers and stuff we have to play with to figure out how to do that. So why wouldn't, why wouldn't you hire them as per diems? You could do that. And, and, and then, if they, then they would be, go through our training right and then they would be fully you know they would be fully trained to ride and then they would just take, they would share collateral duties we did that before and had with one of them and yeah. he did not complete our training program oh so okay. oh okay so and again this is it just yeah. from some of my affiliations right we would like I know with my affiliations they would want you to be part of their group and wouldn't we want anybody that comes to ride our 
ambulance to be part of our organization. That's if he wants to be part of Right, that's if they want to be part of the organization as well. Um, oh, yeah, and, and see, and I guess that, yes, and, and good question, but could, I'd rather not have this discussion right now. No, I think it's probably a discussion we need to have. Do you go to the chief first? Do you go to the provincial committee? Tim is going to the chief first. I, I've reached out to Bill. I'm waiting for him to get back to me. Perfect. Um, I'm just, That's perfect. And then we'll. I was going to set up a meeting with myself and Matt from Community 911, and we we're just going to figure out what needs to be done on everyone's end for okay. this to see if it's even a practical option or not. Yep. And then I'll bring that information back to the board and be like, "This is what we talked about, and this is what we." Yeah. Need. If it'll, if it's legal, if we can do it. Make them. Yeah, my understanding is we can make it legal. It's just might be. Encourage them to become per diems here to reduce the paperwork burden on the South Deerfield Fire Department. Yes. If that's the easiest way to go about this. It, like I said, it's the easiest way to go about it. It just will be a matter of us. Everyone has to be up to our requirements if that's sure. the case. No, I understand. Mm -hmm. No yeah. more. No more than if we had paramedics here who were to go join. Yeah, and service firefighters next door, they would need to be up to their standards absolutely. to operate yeah. as part of their department. Yeah, well, that, that makes sense, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and we, we had this discussion years ago because we tried, I tried as director, building some kind of a bridge between our EMTs and their fire department to have our EMTs do some of the simple, but you know, make the hydrant, potentially run a pump, change in air packs, things like that, and the answer I got back was, well, they really need to train to become full firefighters, and at that point, right. our staff wasn't willing to do that, so we, we walked away from it, but. Yeah, and well, we, but this could be beneficial. If they're, if they're over there, and it could be beneficial to our communities. Oh, so 100%, and they. And, and, but I think, I, I think, the way, what I know of, of the South Dakota Fire, what we would ask is what they would ask of us also. You, you, you just want to be consistent. Right. right. And, and I, I think when, it, when Tim and the, yeah. and the EMS group get here, gets through some of the training already that's happening, then they could take on the additional training. Absolutely. Yeah. Because uh, it, it's, it's really riding, right, on the truck? It's, it's riding on the truck. It's a, it's a bunch of other things. Um, it's just, I just need to see, and I don't think adding those two individuals would increase. And, like, I just, I just need to see the numbers um, to understand how it really works. I need to. I said, I really need to speak to Matt and have him lay out every detail about what the regulatory requirements are going to be, and sure. making sure that if we're incurring that, that, that's fine. But just, I also, I guess they're not technically town of Deerfield employees, right? So they could. No, they're in separate. Yeah, no. so yeah, there's Fire a lot of paperwork they have. Yeah. So, but you, good suggestion about, and you've already done, reach, reaching out to Bill. Yep. And, and, and have that conversation. Yeah, I think, it, like I said, I think it'll be very beneficial, so I'll okay. eager to find out what goes for a word. Unanticipated business. Um, the only thing, Tim, Tim earlier on the agenda, when I, t when I spoke with Tim and I had a, a conversation, look, I, 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 I believe um, if any member of the Board of Oversight has something that they'd like to put on the agenda, I would, I would strongly recommend that you get in contact with Tim. I believe we, we are all here because we represent the individuals, the communities that work, but more, more so, I, I actually think that we represent all the, the, the members of each of the communities, not just our own community. So if there's something that, that you would like to put on the agenda, please, in, in my opinion, and maybe someday we have to put down how we work, our, our operating procedures, but please call Tim. What, what I've asked Tim is we will put, in my opinion, we will put it on the agenda, um, but I don't think if it's something that requires a vote of the group that um, we would vote on it that, that meeting, so we would vote on it at least two meetings so that we have an opportunity to, to review it understand what we're and then come back fully fully understanding the breath and vote on it on the second time but if you have anything and, and tim and i talked about yeah, that and that was just i didn't understand i wasn't sure if things for the agenda had to come from the chair or if any member could well, propose oh, they those. do they do but okay. the chair is in charge of the agenda but i think policy wise in the town of deerfield we, we've always done is anybody that wants anything on the agenda just 
Okay. And if we're off, then that's what I'll do going forward. Yeah. And, 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 but, and but in, it does, the chair does find, you know. And, and, and what does that mean is, like, if there's any information that would, like, so just so sh the chair can understand what the meet, what, where the meeting's going to go. Yeah. But as far as putting anything on the agenda, you know, that, that's something that any member of our board of oversight is, is okay. encouraged to do. And, and as far as posting agendas, um, do we follow the same rules that we do with the select board where, you know, if something's unanticipated, it can be discussed, but um, if it's not on the agenda and if somebody just brings up an issue. It, it's not an agenda, well, general. If it's unanticipated, it sh it, it, the agenda is adjusted that night if you want to vote on it, or, you know, by that right. night, it's still printed out. It's just that it hasn't had the true 48 hours. Right. But if you just randomly bring it up under unanticipated and it was never posted on the agenda, then you really can't vote on it, unless it, it, it's a true emergency. Yeah, it, unanticipated, just especially things that come in within after the notice yeah. posting the agenda. You're right, it, it, and that's legitimate. But yeah. unless it's an emergency, you, you don't have you have to have some time. And and, and for you for, can't force for what course, I, I think it's a is the way we've always done it, and I, I'm sure the other towns on it also. It's that our, our job through, through, through our agenda, what it does is it's notification to our residents what, we're, right. what we intend to do. So all of a sudden it's like, <laughs> how did they vote to give Tom Fighting Kevitz a $80,000 a year salary? Why was that on the agenda? So we wouldn't want to cause, I'm sure Gary Stone would vote yes for that right here. Oh yeah, absolutely. See? <laughs> Do you need a motion? Yeah. Uh, you, you, you need a motion. motion. I, 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 I don't know. I was thinking on Yeah, all right. But, but anyway. A motion to charge Tom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. For last year's overtime expenses. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, yeah. So, so I encourage everyone to, and again, to be to be a proactive board. Um, and, and if you if there's something that you hear or see or, or want, put it on the agenda. Um, and, and we'll keep moving. Um, all right. Any closing remarks? I just don't know if this is something we need to add to the agenda or we have a different conversation another time. There's a lot of costs that are currently being incurred by overtime by other staff that were being done by either David or Zoe, more so David now he's retired, that David did, as far as I'm aware, for free without, like, I don't know if he was being like had a stipend or something, um, but like, when every time Zach come in, comes in, I'll use Zach as an example because he's the biggest example of it. Anytime there's a truck issue or a technology issue when Zach comes in, I pay him overtime. So I don't know if this is a discussion we should have as a board about if overtime is the best option for that or if there's a better option for that. Um, but I paid him like 10 hours of overtime this month, maybe. I'm not, I don't have the numbers so far, but when the- I would say that's light, whatever it is. I'm definitely not charging for when, Like when is. the ambulance broke down, Zach had to come in and then bring it down to Northampton and come back. And when we had, other techno I just don't know if there's a better issue you know, there's a better way for us to pay for somebody to give additional services outside their hourly like rate <laughs> right right now Tim what I would say until we hire a full-time um, chief let's let's maintain the present the present way of doing things okay. but that's that's one thing that in in I would I would hope one of the things that the new new chief when we come in one of the things that we're going to talk about is about structure and, uh, uh, and, and uh, the importance of having an assistant uh, and or and or training and or these different the different positions that that <coughs> and actually Zoe had talked about some of that to, to begin with also. So it's okay for the for the interim if I continue to pay Zach if Zach has to come in at two o'clock in the morning to deal with the truck issue to pay him overtime. Or if Alicia has to come in to do an operational thing to pay her overtime. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That, that was the impression, and that's how I've been operating. Yeah. But I just wanted clarification. We can't not pay them. Right. <laughs> and when we have the discussion with Brenda going forward about distributing these duties and is it a stipend, we we need to make sure that we're clear with her so we get a clear answer as to. Would a stipend cover it? Do we need to pay the overtime? How does this all work? Because the last thing we want to do is wind up in court because we haven't paid people appropriately. So, yep. All right. I just I just wanted to make sure I covered yeah. that. Yeah. But but I right now I, I I think we should keep. And personally, I think we should, what you're doing now is fine. But then as we get then we have to discuss how how we're moving forward as a department. Yeah. 
the, the jobs that are assigned, you know, are collateral duties if, the, if you're doing it on your regular, you know, you have time during your regular. Right. But if they're call, if you're absolutely called in, like at 2 o'clock in the morning, to take care of a broken down truck, that's absolutely overtime. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, that's, you know, it's, you're I agree not on sure. shift, you're not, no. you know, you're just doing extra stuff. And I guess I'll just, I will do a better job of keeping a record of those costs so we can have a direct reflection of which of those overtime hours are reflected as what would required be duties. When you fill out your timesheet is you just say, you know, that you had that rando two o'clock to four, three hour at two o'clock in the morning, you just say truck broke down or something like that. And that way it, it's, it's accounted because I look at each pay sheet but it's not, you know, you don't have to go back months. It's, you know, there isn't any issue. Right. So you'd like us to be more specific in like the little note section on our time cards of what we are? Yeah, before, if, you know, for some, I mean, obviously if, you, if you're if you held over, you know, I can see that, you know, if you're gone beyond your shift. I usually just put like, if we have a late call, just using late call as an example, like I'll right. put that this day right. I was held till this time for a late call in Sunderland. But if, you, if, but if you got called in and we already have shift, people on shifts, why, you know, my question would be, why are you coming in at 2 o'clock in the morning? So you just write down, right. broken down. So the if Alicia, if we're critically low on a supply and Alicia will order supplies, then she has to come in to deal with it and it takes her an hour, she can put in for that. Right. Yeah. And you just write, just, I mean, little notes really are helpful because then I don't have to chase it down. <clears throat> I mean, we'll be very clear about it. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. No, it, 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 we're not. We're not trying to be jerks about it. It I just think helps you guys are trying us. To be jerks. I just want to it's going to help us going forward to really dial in how much of the overtime is dedicated to patient care and covering shifts versus how much is all the other stuff that goes on in the department. And I think that's where we put ourselves at a little bit of a disadvantage. And no, I'm not speaking disparagingly about the job that Zoe did, but. This way when we get in front of a finance committee and they're questioning the overtime, here's why we've got the overtime. X number of hours were due to maintenance issues on trucks, X number of hours were due to covering people who were out sick, X number of hours were people who didn't show up for their shift because of this, X number of hours were because we were held over because of the calls. And it helps everyone yeah. determine later on down the road whether stipends are more appropriate or hourly wages. And we'll just take ordering and I'm not, just as an example, is it better to give somebody a $250 a month stipend to take care of ordering materials, or is it better financially to pay them overtime? And it has to work for both people, right? Because maybe for the employee, 85% of the time they can do it during their regularly scheduled work, but then they're getting this incentive to take care of that, and it's it becomes a level costing on a stipend versus overtime costing in emergencies, but you can't figure that out until you actually see the numbers on that either. Yeah. And but it's, uh, so it's trending. Well, yeah. also it's it's one of the things that the new chief, it shouldn't, we shouldn't be expecting him to do this. Correct. Uh, Correct. The new chief comes in with an Excel spreadsheet or whatever software you use, and you have codes that say held over, you know, I don't mean it's HO, I don't know. Um, you know, but then you have this spreadsheet that does the stuff for you. At the end of the month, you press a button and it gives you a printout. This is not something that somebody should sit down and spend three hours a month doing. It should be automated. Right. Um, yeah. You know, so that's something that the new chief and the new assistant that they they select from the staff, um, you know, works on. Right. And, and, and bottom line is that we are no. Our, our, our service is matured. So we, we went into forming a service the last 10 years. We, we together have developed a service that's running very, very well ab above all of our ex original expectation. But we're maturing as, a, as an organization and those are the next steps. The, 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 they're the more the finer management point. And, and if you're in your own home and looking at your own budget, Geez, it'd be nice to know how you're spending your paycheck. 
and that, and that's and that and that and now and this is just the next level for us to explain to our our stakeholders what how we're spending the money that's all and 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 you're right so at work we we have everything as a work a work order work task and then i can go back in and find out oh geez that job took eight hours last time this job took 24 hours the same job how come this time is 24 versus eight so we're just getting better we're just we're just getting a better mature system and that also saves us time later like Carolyn's not going to call Zach and say, what's this two and a half hours at two o'clock? You know, because it's already been reported. And, right. And it's just easier for you. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, a couple notes just is very really helpful because then I'll say, well, geez, we already had, we had four people on, you know, or two people on. So why was this random one separate, you know, or something like that. Absolutely. Or, you know, like somebody had a doctor's appointment. So like, well, someone came in and subbed. Sure. And, and you know, it was very clear that there was a substitution. So it was yeah. specific. Yeah. 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 That's one good. Yeah. We'll give it. Today's a great example. I think I spent most of my day here today on and off, but just like the truck needed to get picked up and then go back down and an issue here and I had pump training and so there's probably six things on today that each have an hour, an hour and a half on them. And so that's kind of the question of how would you like that dealt with? Because yeah. these but, are all tasks but, that have yeah. never been reported before now. Right. That are and that just allows me not to have to call or to bug Tim. No, this is mostly about around overtime. I mean, if you're on your regular shift and you're Absolutely. doing your regular job, yeah. you're not going to be saying no, 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 at no, nine thirty no, I did this and at ten forty-five yeah. I did that. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. 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 No, it's not. It's just the hours incurred outside of forty hours. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's just trying to an analysis right. of what, right. how we're spending our overtime. Okay, Chief, you have anything else? I don't think so. Anybody else have anything? Entertain a motion? Motion second. We have a motion made and seconded. Anybody want to discuss the journey? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Clear unanimous, Tim, at uh, 7.50. All right, we're all set if you want to.